Welcome back to another episode of Growth Marketers Podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Rowe. Samuel is not with us today, but we did have a guest on the podcast. His name is Terry Arbaugh. Uh, he's the VP of Sales and Marketing at a manufacturing company, electronic manufacturing company called Ccomp. And I think this was a, it was a great podcast. I had a lot of fun. Terry uh, really you know, spoke our language here at 1IMS, really has a deep understanding of digital and the impact that digital can have on an organization. We work with a lot of manufacturing companies. And so we're starting a series here where we're going to dive into conversations with leaders, uh, marketing leaders uh, and innovators in the manufacturing space. And so Terry shared really what he's been able to accomplish what his company has implemented at Ccomp and what sort of impact that's had on their business. So let's dive right in. Please, if you enjoy the episode, give us a like, a subscribe, but we'll get started. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I'm joined today with a guest, Terry Arbaugh, who's the uh, Vice President of Sales and Marketing at Ccomp. Terry, Please uh, give our listeners just a brief introduction to who you are and then uh, also you know, who Ccomp is and the type of companies uh, you work with. Yeah, absolutely, Taylor. And thanks for having me today. Yeah, Terry Arbaugh, I've been 15 years now with Ccomp, right? So I historically have been had a sales background and everything I've done uh, even before this company. And I kind of joke, you know, the CEO is a, a friend of mine before we started working together. And I complained enough about our marketing that he just said, fine, you do it. And that's how I'm and marketing, right? So I kind of view the sales and marketing angle or the marketing angle from the sales lens, uh, I guess you want to say that. So we can get into that a little bit more later. Absolutely. Uh, Ccomp is a electronics manufacturer. So I am based in San Diego and that's where our company is headquartered globally. We have our own factory in Dongguan, China, where we build industrial, medical, and consumer products, primarily for customers in the US uh, and in Europe. All right. Awesome. So let's start there in terms of how you got uh, some of these marketing responsibilities, because I think that's something that is pretty common, right? Is, you know, I don't want to say sales and marketing butt heads, but sales says, hey, you know, we're not getting enough leads in marketing saying, well, we're giving you leads, but you guys aren't closing them or not turning into uh, any opportunities. So I think you're in a unique position that you're on both sides of that fence, right? And so there's no mystery or there's no effort that needs to be put in place in terms of sales and marketing alignment because you're managing both departments. But what were you seeing? Uh, what challenges were you facing that caused you to, as you said, complain about what's going on with the marketing perspective? Well, initially, and we were, when I first joined, again, it's been a long time, we were a really small company. So, and historically, the start when I first joined this company, Ccomp began as a US sales office for a Hong Kong company called Display Tech. So, we were really just selling LCD modules. And over the years, we've grown, we've added a power division. So, we do consumer and medical power supplies and customer chargeable batteries and charging docks. And then we started doing more and more contract manufacturing and product development engineering. And then about uh, eight years ago, acquired uh, our own factory, right? So kind of making that transition from being more of a trading company to a manufacturer. And so kind of throughout that whole time early on, it was just the marketing, the website, the printed material, everything else we had that was customer facing was really a copy of the Hong Kong entity, yep. the old display tech Hong Kong entity. And I thought the aesthetic of it, maybe the look and feel and vibe was not the best fit for our market, for our customers, like the things that they wanted to see. So it was really more of kind of the look and feel and how we present ourselves. And then we've gotten deeper into you know different strategies. How do we get better alignment between marketing and sales? I'm not really interested in vanity metrics mm -hmm. of marketing, right? Like, Hey, more site visits is great, but if it doesn't turn into dollars, it doesn't really matter. Right. Mm -hmm. So kind of taking that view of how we look at sales and marketing and trying to knock down some of the silos or labels and really make it a, a revenue generation team or a team that really serves the customer by telling the right story, highlighting the pain points the customer goes through and making sure we're doing everything we can collectively to generate more either qualified leads or actual real business. Yeah, and that's interesting. We see this model a lot where the OEM and the manufacturer then they have distributors or manufacturers reps and their website, like you said, is basically just a carbon copy of that original manufacturer. And if you represent four or five different manufacturers, then you basically just have their products capabilities kind of plastered all over the website and all of your competitors have the exact same information. So where right. did you you know, start to understand or how did you start to understand one that you, you know, we need to differentiate ourselves and then two as you mentioned, how do we, how did you, you know, learn, like we need to tell the story 
through our customers' eyes and how our business is going to benefit our customers, making that whole buying experience more customer-centric rather than traditionally where you would look at a manufacturing company as being very seller-centric. Right. And it's a great question. And I'll probably give... And this, you'll get used to this. I'll give probably long answers. No problem. <laughs> That's the sales side. But for a couple of reasons, right? Just like you said, most electronics companies, component companies, uh, even contract manufacturing uh, companies you know, like, like us, they just tell everybody what they have and what they do. We have this sort of equipment. We have these products. These are the specs. You know, These are the certifications, which is all important. But ultimately, especially when you're doing manufacturing, when you're doing design and manufacturing, what problems you solve and what you do for the customer, right, is the most important thing. And I come from before I was in electronics, I was in the golf business. I did golf club R&D for a few years. And then I did sales in the golf industry for a few years. But when you're taking clubs that have been designed by some of the smartest people in the world, the specs are really, really critical from, you know, the weight distribution and size of the club head and the shaft and the length and the flex and the club head speed and everything else really goes into it. The specs are really, really critical. But if you give that same club to Tiger Woods or to me or you or to you know another random person who plays four times a year because they have a job and work you know Mm -hmm. and and family and all that and they don't really play very often how important are all those specs to that person yeah right what does it do in their hands what are they able to do with it is much more important so talking about what they're going to get from that is more valuable than talking about what it actually is and taking that same approach into what we do. Contract manufacturing is difficult, right? It's Mm -hmm. very complex. It's expensive in terms of cost and time investment you make in tooling. And there are so many decisions you need to make. There's so many things that you have to do in the right sequence. And there is also a lot of nuance that people don't understand, right? The world of things that you don't know that you don't know. And manufacturing is really big. And so we just wanted to try to tell the story and communicate both from the sales team's angle and the marketing team's angle, focusing on what's most important to the customer, which is delighting their customers, Mm -hmm. right? We're manufacturing for a brand. The brand is selling to their customers. And that's what they care most about, not what equipment we have and what our processes are. And again, although those things are important, it's not the main thing that our customers really care the most about. Sure, It's kind of table stakes, right? If you're going to be a manufacturer, you have to have manufacturing equipment. It's kind of table stakes. So if you talk about that, feels like you lose the plot. Yeah, right. Like everybody has that capability, right? And I mean, right, I think right. the golf analogy is perfect, right? I mean, to the right person, like you said, all, all of that makes sense. The weight distribution and, you know, the speed and all that kind of stuff. Even the materials, obviously, with the drivers right now and titanium and all these kind of things that they're right. doing, right? Carbon. But like you said, you know, I just, I want to hit the fairway. So right. is that going to be the outcome that it's looking for me? So I think that's a a perfect example. In making this transition and changing the way you approach your marketing and your messaging and even your sales process, what sort of impact has that had on your business? It's had a great impact. And, you know, the telling the story and from the customer angle, it's not a fast results type of a thing, right? If we're creating content, if we're creating videos, if we're really trying to highlight and relate to the challenges our customers are facing. That's something that takes a lot of time. People are going to you know, find it, read it, maybe digest it, maybe they'll read it again, maybe they'll watch a video, maybe they'll forward it on to somebody else, but it might take quite a long time to actually have an impact. But certainly the quality of the conversations we're having with prospects or with you know people that find us for the first time, it just starts at a higher level because generally they've seen several pieces of content mm-hmm. or a lot of our content because it's really relevant specifically to the challenges they're facing. And so by the time they talk to us quite often, they already have a pretty good understanding of who we are, what we do, and who we do it for. And they know if they fit into that category. So it kind of gets us off on a, a head start, if you will, kind of in the in the prospect engagement. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of statistics out now about you know how much of the buyer's journey, if you will, is complete by the time someone reaches out to a salesperson. And I think right. manufacturers and people in the manufacturing space, I hear all the time is like, well, our customers, you know, our customers don't find us online or our customers aren't online. But it's a bit of a catch-22, right? Is like, are your customers not finding you online because you haven't done anything to let them find you online? Because if you right. look at it objectively, <laughs> You're talking about a very technical audience, engineer, you know, engineer types. They're the type that does research and they're going to want to try to figure things out before they, you know, they don't want to talk to a salesperson that's going to give them a sales pitch, right? They want to have, like you said, their ducks in a row and come to you and say, hey, 
I noticed you work with this type of company and you have these capabilities. We're looking for something similar. And I'm curious if you can accommodate my needs, right? So the more you can address that and speak to that, I think the better off you're going to be. And then when you talk about that sales and marketing alignment, you know, what's better as a salesperson than to have people that are more educated and closer to, you know, making a purchase rather than spending your whole time educating them on how everything works, especially with something like contract manufacturing, where it's really so broad, right? If you just talk about going to Google and searching for contract manufacturer, contract electronics manufacturer, that's not specific enough to find what you're looking for, right? Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of good points there. The very last one I'll take first, but finding a a contract manufacturer that will accept your business, depending on what size you're at. You know, some of these big tier ones, if you're not doing 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year, you're not even allowed to you know, in the front door, mm-hmm. right? So you can find electronics manufacturers, but are they the right fit for your product, for your, you know, the size of your, both your product and your volume, your ability to scale, right? So it's not just even finding one, it's finding the right fit, which is really, really critical. Back to your first point. And I've heard this, I don't know what the, the latest number is, Taylor, but uh, I think it was a Harvard Business Review said 70% of the buying cycle mm-hmm. is done before anybody reaches out to a salesperson. And I would argue, I would believe that in our industry specifically with the more technical people that we deal with, with a lot of engineers, I would bet it's way higher than 70%. You know, I think you know, 80, 85, even pushing 90% of the buying process is done before our prospect, our customer would want to reach out and talk to somebody. Right. And so taking that into account, combining that with the fact that from the sales angle, you know, sales are made quite often you know, after the 6th, 8th, 10th, 12th yep. touch. Right. A lot of times prospects, somebody has to get comfortable or familiar with a salesperson or a company or a product before they really engage. So if you can kind of take both of those things together, it really only makes sense to start delivering a lot of really valuable content about the challenges that our customers face, about the things you're going to do. How do you choose a contract manufacturer? How do you protect your IP, for example, if you're using an overseas manufacturer? What three things do hardware startups really struggle the most with that lead to failure? You know, there's a 90 plus percent of hardware startups fail, right? So let's talk about that. Yeah, how do you, you know, how much does manufacturing cost? That's such a hard question to answer, but those are the types of things people want to know. So if you can kind of deliver content around that and become a a resource for them, whether they choose to work with us or not, Mm -hmm. we're servicing you know, that customer, that prospect where they're at and helping them along their journey. And that's really one of the main things, our core purpose as a company, our mission is to help innovators deliver awesome. Mm -hmm. We say, right, we want to make the world a better place by turning great ideas into great products. Sure. Well, nowhere in that mission statement or vision statement is only if we make a buck. Yeah. Right. So we really try to live that mission and vision and provide value to people so they can be successful in their hardware journey. Hopefully it's with us, right? If we're the right fit, being a competitive salesperson, I'm going to go after and try to win that business if it's if it would be the right fit for us and the right fit for the customer. Right. But other than that, we want to make sure people are successful regardless of where they right. go. Yeah, and I think that's such an important piece that so many companies, I see this trend in, you know, maybe maybe I'm biased because we work so, you know, with so many manufacturing companies, but uh, we also work with companies in other space, software and SaaS, and you see those companies being a little bit more ahead of the curve. And one of the objections that I hear a lot from manufacturing companies is like, well, we don't want to give away any of the secret sauce, right? So like if the more we put information out there, you mentioned pricing, right? Well, if we can't tell our pricing, because there's so many different variables that go into it, or we can't talk about how we do this, or we can't talk about the clients we work with, because we'll give away basically secrets to our competitors. Or if we make it so clear on how they do it, then they, the company could go do it by themselves, right? But you make such a good point about like, what we're trying to do is educate the people that are the right fit for us, right? And if by doing that, the content we're creating is also educating other people and that go on and are successful in other areas or work with other companies, I'm okay with that because we're not spending any resources, right? And you mentioned the vanity metrics of like, there could be a million people that come to your website and maybe only five of them went through the whole thing. And obviously that's an extremely low number, but just for the sake of the argument, maybe only five of them, you know, filled out the quote, but you mentioned, Hey, they're already 80% of the way 
through that sales process. And if we close, you know, four out of five of those, I don't care how many people, I don't care that these other companies came to our website. Like we're not in a volume game. We're trying to find the people that are the right fit. And I think so many, uh, so many companies miss that piece when talking about spending effort, the required resources and effort it takes to create this level of content because they're worried about giving away too many secrets. And I'm not sure why that is. And I'm curious of how internally (laughs) that process went. Like, how did you get buy-in from the rest of the team ownership uh, CEO, those type of things to say, hey, we're going to start spending some resources on the content that, as you mentioned, is going to take a long time to really come to fruition. Mm-hmm. Maybe, you know, we're only going to get 10 views on this video, but if they're all very 10 qualified, very, you know, very qualified views, then we'll take it. But these are just things that we're going to spend money on. And it's hard for me to measure ROI in the next three months or six months. But how did you get the buy in for that and, you know, the ability to stay disciplined to actually <laughs> see it through? Yeah. Part of it, you know, is, if you don't have a huge marketing budget, you've got to get creative, mm-hmm. right? So part of the answer is like, well, this is, you know, these are the things we can afford to do, right? Just cost our the, time, yeah. The really, yeah, the really practical answer. But yeah, I think, again, we, we want to be so customer centric. It just makes sense when you live by, again, the values we just described and you start thinking, okay, how can we tell this story and how can we scale the story? So before the pandemic, obviously, when we were traveling a lot, we have great experiences with customers, right? We love people. Generally, people work, you know, working with us, you know, enjoy working with our team. We had a, an event one night at CES where, you know, we were hosting kind of some drinks and had a bunch of people. And one of our customers came up, we hadn't seen him in a little while and just like gave a couple of us like mm-hmm. a big hug. And there was somebody else there that we had just started talking to another customer that was invited to this thing. And <laughs> he was like, your customers <laughs> hug you guys? Right. Like I thought everybody hates their contract manufacturer. Right? It's was, it was just kind of a really funny thing that we talk about now. So we always talk about exporting the CECOM experience. Right. So when I'm talking to my team, when we're traveling with our uh, reps or going to see uh, prospects, if it's at their uh, going to see customers at their place of business or if we're taking them out for dinner or for an event or anything like that. We always want to export that CECOM culture and make sure they feel like really valued, really taken care of. So how did we how could we do that from a marketing standpoint, kind of from the website and everything else we do. So that's really how it went. Now, there's a lot of people in this industry, and this is an older industry, right? Electronics manufacturing, that's kind of... And manufacturing, I think, in general is fairly old. So you have this older guard of people that aren't as maybe digitally savvy as the SaaS Mm -hmm. space, like you mentioned earlier. You know, they're doing unbelievable things, you know, in in marketing and, and content creation and things like that. We just don't see that much of it here, you know, in the space we're in. And you also have that same kind of older mentality of, hey, we're not, we're going to lock the doors here and and put a firewall around everything we do and not tell anybody because we don't want uh, our secrets to get out. And so there is some balancing of that. There are some, when we're manufacturing something for a customer, we're generally under NDA and most of the time we can't talk about exactly what we're doing for them. So there are some things that we have to keep a secret. There are some, you know, proprietary processes and things like that internally that you can't always talk about and some metrics and things like that that you can't always talk about because they lead to um, or might be tied to a specific product or customer. You know, so there are some things we have to be careful with, but as much as we can tell that story and tell how we do things, we're not a threat to Flextronics and to JVL and San Mina, those huge, you know, huge CMs are not worried about my two minutes to launch videos, right? So we can, we can talk about some of these things we do really to benefit our target customer who we can benefit the most and add the most value to without giving away the farm to the competitors. And ultimately, if the competitor sees something that we're doing, they still have to do it. And then they still have to tell the story. And I believe that even if somebody's trying to copy us, we'll still do it better. Right. And, and you know, I think that's, that's yeah, where I land no, on it. Those are all great points. And there's a couple of things that I always tell my clients is one is like, we might not be able to tell the exact, like you said, the exact process that we have or the exact, you know, pricing is obviously a big one, right? We can't, we, I don't know what the, you probably, it's probably impossible for you to tell the pricing because there's so many variables that go into it, but you can't, there's nothing that you right. can't address, right? You need to address every question right. that your customer is asking and price is always going to be a big one. So all of those variables that impact it, let's talk about it. Let's write a blog about how all those prices can impact and how ultimately you can come down to a quote. And you don't have to ever tell the price, but when people are researching that is a great you know, resource for them to say, this is what goes into 
pricing. And the other piece is, right. you know, you talk about, you know, they, they still have to go do it. I think that's the most important part. If you can write a blog post or, you know, make a video and put it on your website and what you're doing is so simple and so straightforward that a customer can go do it themselves or a competitor can rip it off from that, you know, two minute video that you made, then your right. business is not complex enough to have really much of a demand, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so right. There, yeah. you have to look at, you know, who are we really? And that's a big piece of it. And I think there's a lot of freedom once companies, once they realize, okay, here's the niche that we're going after. And you mentioned like, hey, these companies aren't worried about us. So these, you know, we can't work with these companies. Like once you stop trying to be all things to all people, it becomes much easier right. for you to create that content on your website because you're not worried. Well, what if, you know, this type of company comes to our website and, you know, they're turned off by this because you're, you're okay. We're, we're okay with, right. with, you know, getting past, getting through those companies that aren't really a great fit so that we can grow and scale with companies that are the right fit. And that's, again, yeah, I, I go back to what I said earlier is like, that's a top down, like we need leadership. We need everyone to buy into that so that we can execute at a high level because it's not an easy thing to do, right? It's easy to say in practice, like, Hey, let's only get the you know top customers that are a perfect fit for us. But when, when you first have to, and you're on the sales side as well, right? So the first lead you, you have to get through the website that you have to call and talk to them and tell them, Hey, you know what? I don't think actually we're the best fit for you. Here's one of our competitors, like go, go work with them. Right. That's a hard thing to do when it affects your personal income as well. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I will give, you know, our CEO a ton of credit over the years of really helping guide and define, you know, who we are and who we're not. And so we've really had a lot of these discussions, Taylor, where it becomes really easy to, if you're talking to a, a potential customer, to understand if we would be a great fit for them and they would be a great mm -hmm. fit for us, right? That's really, really important in this contract manufacturing space. And so it really takes the emotion out of some of those decisions. And again, going back to helping innovators deliver awesome, this is exactly what we do. If somebody comes and it turns out either they're too early for us or they have maybe they need a technology that's not really in our core you know, competency. We have a really deep network um, that we refer people to. I refer prospects to uh, other companies all the time to help them mm -hmm. succeed, right? So it really has, we've really defined uh, yeah, who we are and who we're not very, very clearly. And then, yeah, to the original point of, if somebody could just knock us off, right? Just copy it really quickly. You don't, you don't really have uh, a mm -hmm. differentiator. And our, we're we're unique, right? So we are a US owned manufacturing facility in China and it's a wholly owned facility, right? Not a joint mm -hmm. venture, you know, it's not a partnership. It's 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 our factory in China. We have a Western management team. Our VP of manufacturing and quality is Scottish, right? He lives in China, but he oversees the factory in China. And our business model has really been developed over a whole bunch of years of having some pretty bad experiences with different vendors. And this is not just a China thing, just generally in the electronics world. And what we've done for a long time is say, man, that scenario, that was pretty awful. Let's write that down and never mm -hmm. do that to anybody. Right. And so we've built an entire business model. So our policy and how we operate with customers comes from all these bad experiences. Yep. Right. And so we have policies and processes and people and teams built around delivering a much better experience than most people have ever gotten uh, dealing with a contract manufacturer, especially if you're going yeah, uh, offshore. Absolutely. Well, let's get tactical here for a second. Um, I think you know a lot of, I'm sure listeners to this are saying, well, yes, this all sounds great, but how do I, obviously electronics manufacturing, contract manufacturing is not the, uh, not the sexiest industry, right? And especially for a, a marketer, <laughs> right? When you think about, you know, studying marketing yeah. in school, that wasn't the, the case study that you went out and developed, right? right. And branding and messaging and, you know, customer positioning, all that kind of stuff. So how did you get started? How do you, do you have a process for content creation? What does that look like in terms of coming up with the idea of the topic and then ultimately bring that content to life? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So we, going back to the early days on the display tech side, before we had the other, these other divisions, really it was, man, we get the same questions over and over, right? The same technical questions about LCD modules. And so we started building out a forum, right? Just a forum so we could post those, those same questions and answer them. And then that kind of kept getting filled out and that works mm -hmm. really, really well, right? So rather than answering the question over, you know, a hundred times, you answer it once and then mm -hmm. refer people, 
And then we would have engineers from different companies working with maybe our same display. And they would be talking to each other saying, hey, I, I followed that, but I'm still having this problem. Can anybody help? And somebody would jump in and say, oh, yeah, this is what, you know. And so that worked out really well. And so we wanted just to continue to build on that to create mm-hmm. value on topics that are really relevant and really common. And so we started writing some blog posts and we kind of crowdsourced some of this stuff from our from yeah. our whole team, sales team and engineering and some of the operations folks. So we have a list of topics available. So when something comes up, we have a list and then we recruit kind of people to write. You keep you know, a, a write, list of topics. Write, okay. Yeah, right. Write an article. And then that'll go through my marketing manager and myself. We'll kind of review. She'll make sure that the voice mm-hmm. is right, right? We want to speak kind of in a brand voice. Things should sound similar. And then she'll make sure, obviously, that we're making sure the keywords that we're trying to hit specific with that topic are represented well uh, in that content. Then I'll do a once over as well to make sure just from whether it's anything technical, you know, or anything around, you know, wording or or really just details. Sometimes I'm a little bit picky on on how things are worded. So yeah, we'll make sure that that gets an overview from both of us before we send that out. So we crowdsource uh, internally for that stuff. We will also have some of our guys who speak, the sales guys on power supplies, for example. We have a couple of uh, industrial medical globally certified power supplies with with interchangeable adapters. So, hey, can you do a video just talking about this product and showing, you know, how it works mm-hmm. properly? You know, that's really really popular. And then during the pandemic, I started doing some 2 minutes to launch. I called them some videos where it's really another same concept. What things are important that we get asked a lot that are not as technically specific but a little bit higher level, you know, complex things like, hey, yeah, how do you choose a CM mm-hmm. was one. So something like that. How do you protect your IP? Like those things I mentioned. So trying to put out some content, again, specific to things our customers care most about. That's been the idea. And then repurposing some of those, right? So you can write a long blog post or you can write uh, or, or do these videos and then taking snippets from each of those things and turning it into mm-hmm. a LinkedIn post, right? So try to repurpose and take some of those content. And Absolutely. Use I love ways. it. Speaking our language. That's exactly what we preach. <laughs> um, and what does your, your marketing team look like? Obviously, you guys are creating a ton of content in different formats. And so how many marketers yep. do you have internally strictly on the marketing team? Myself and marketing manager. There's right. two of us. So uh, anyone listening to this, right. so there's we no use excuses, some, right? So yeah. two two people. <laughs> yeah, we. So what's our? Go ahead. We use some outside agencies at times. So we've done some corporate mm-hmm. uh, videos. Uh, we've done some videos uh, series around uh, NPI, new product introduction. Right. So in those cases, we'll hire some outside resources to help us, you know, tell that story. Um, but for the most part, internally and in all the things we do, myself and my marketing manager. And then again, because I try to eliminate the silo between sales and marketing, the sales team is also getting recruited into some content, right? So we'll have, you know, a half dozen other people that uh, at times will be creating some content, maybe helping with some videos, things like that. So, but from specific marketing title, there's, yeah, yeah there's two of us. No, and, and that's, I think <laughs> that's more, I think it's more understandable, more, more reasonable for companies to wrap their head around a two person marketing team. We talk about a, a kind of a content creation, content production framework, and you actually outlined most of the skill sets, if you will, that are required to make that happen, right? If you think about it, you need kind of a visionary to say like, hey, here's what our marketing vision looks like. Here's the type of content we need to create. Then you're going to need subject matter experts, right? Because we're talking about technical content. So we need subject matter experts to talk about the content, whether that's written content, whether that's video content, whether that's a podcast, whether that's an infographic. We need someone who has that skill set. In your case, sounds like that's the sales team, engineers. I love going to the sales team. I think that's such an underutilized resource that every company has. These guys are having these conversations every single day over and over and over. And you accomplish multiple things. One is, you know, there's a little bit of an ego there, right? Of like, hey, we're going to you as a subject matter expert, which is great. These guys love to talk. So they're going to (laughs) talk your ear off and tell you everything you need to know if you ask them the right questions. Right. Two, they really are, you know, ultimately the, your best salespeople are, should be subject matter experts because they're the ones on the front lines explaining your products, your services, those type of things. But also you're going to save them so much time in the future because you mentioned, hey, these guys are asking the same questions over and over. Let's put that on our website, right? So now we answer at one time perfectly and we don't have to recite that over and over. We can right. get, refer people to that. And even if we're just talking about the people that are already in our pipeline, not even talking about new visibility to the website, we're talking about just the people there. You're saving that time that you don't have to explain yourself over and over. And now you require less salespeople because you don't have to have 50 conversations, right? 50 people can read it. 
then the people right. that are ready to work can actually just close the business. So not only saving time, they're increasing their output and their capacity, which ultimately helps their own personal bottom line by making more money, right? Because they can close more deals without having to yep. have all these conversations over and over. So a little bit of a tangent. Yep. And it helps on helps yeah. onboarding, helps onboarding, Every- helps training new people, right? If you have if you have all this big content mm-hmm. library, we just hired somebody new last month on my sales team. And that's a big part of the beginning stages is read all this stuff, watch all this stuff. I bet he's mm-hmm. sick of me. He's sick of watching watching my videos and seeing my face and my voice, you know, talking about all this stuff we do. But it is great resources that, you know, can be watched over and over too. It's like, wait a minute, I remember seeing something yeah. like that. Let me check that out again. And so yeah, yeah, really. And so good if, we, yeah, if we go back to that framework, right? So we talked about you need kind of that visionary, you need the subject matter expert. Expert. Now you have basically raw content, right? So then you need somebody to kind of a creative person to edit and format that content. So this is where I think, you know, some of that could be done internally, some of it could be done externally. The written content, I think it makes sense. You could probably have someone internally do that, right? You're formatting it, you're looking at it from a search perspective, yep. maybe adding a, a little bit of a graphic design, whatever that may be, if you're putting it in a blog post or something. Video mm-hmm. content, you know, a lot of manufacturing companies probably doesn't make sense to have video editors and people shooting video videographers, uh, you know, on staff. So I think that's a key piece where you can certainly outsource. And then, you know, you take that and then the next piece is then distributing that content, right? So we have this polished piece of content. Well, how do we get it in front of more people? It sounds like you guys are taking, you know, an organic kind of approach to that organic social media, posting that on social media. You're also trying to get more visibility through organic search. Those are great ways to make that happen. There's other areas, obviously paid media, paid social, paid search. They can drive more visibility. There's, you know, partnerships that you can do with industry publications and websites, anything along those lines. But really that's the key to marketing, right? Is to content creation rather is to get all of that, those pieces, right? And so where I think it makes sense to outsource, right. if you need to outsource, would be on areas that don't make sense for you to have internally. Where it doesn't make sense to outsource is something like that subject matter expert, right? So if you're hiring an agency with the intention right. of they're going to go and you know write all this content from scratch that's going to go on our website, that's going to address the top you know concerns our customers are having and resonate with them in the messaging and capture us as a company and what our vision is. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? That you have that knowledge internally. What right. you need, you may need that visionary piece of someone right. who can help you with the overall structure and like, hey, here's what we need to accomplish. You may need someone to help coordinate and organize everything because obviously there's a million different things you could do from a marketing perspective. But that subject matter expert is always internal, should always be internal. And then there's other right. pieces, you know, technical development work, design work, video, you know, SEO, paid media. That's where it might make sense for you to hire help. But I think the core of that yeah. content creation can be done internally without a ton of resources. I totally agree with you. And that's in our experience when we've outsourced some work, we end up being very heavily involved in the content creation or in the editing Mm -hmm. or rewrites of scripts and and everything else. Because again, just like you said, what we do is complex. When you ask questions, I have been hosting a kind of a weekly hardware room. Last year is on Clubhouse. Uh, Now I'm co-hosting at Thursday nights at 7 p.m. Pacific on Twitter spaces, really about hardware. There's a group of us that are really dedicated to answering questions about product development, about manufacturing, about engineering, you know, like technical things, manufacturing scale things and all that. So we kind of have all of these conversations going and almost every, the answer to almost every question can start with, (laughs) well, it depends, right? And so when you try to outsource content creation to somebody who doesn't intimately Mm -hmm. know all of the ins and outs and pitfalls of everything that can possibly happen in hardware manufacturing, Mm -hmm. it just falls short, right? It falls flat, even Mm -hmm. for really good writers, technical writers, things like that. They just kind of miss the mark. So that's why we've basically kept that part in-house to your point, Taylor. And then the things we don't do, yeah, video production and video editing and some other things like that, we will outsource and then we'll really collaborate with that outside partner uh, to make sure we create that content. And it has the right voice. It has the right information and yeah, conveys absolutely. the right message. Um, and yeah, I was actually just going to bring that up. That's kind of a final point here about your what you did with Clubhouse and uh, I guess Twitter spaces. Now you're, you're kind of transitioning over there. Yeah, We always talk to our clients about becoming a Wikipedia essentially for your industry, right? It's like what you want to do as marketers uh, and as a company is like you want everyone in your addressable market, right? To know who you are and what you offer. And you want to position yourself as a thought leader, right? You want to have some brand equity for someone to think, well, when I think a CCOM automatically, they have credibility there that's built in because I know that they know what they're talking about. Whether I'm ready to do business with you or not, 
right. when the time comes, I would trust your judgment. And how you do that is creating that educational content and creating conversations, right? I think a lot of manufacturing companies don't, they aren't contributing to LinkedIn. They're not creating conversations and certainly not starting discussions in Clubhouse or Twitter spaces. I think that's the next level of it and kind of real-time conversations. But we always talk about this idea of creating community and creating conversations. And I think that's something that's really exciting that you guys are doing and definitely unique in the industry. Yeah, it's been, and it's been really fun and really rewarding, right? So for one of the the drives for me to start doing this was figuring out a way that I can use all of my experience and, and knowledge and everything I have around what we do and just try to give back, right? There's not doing clubhouse and having a lot of these discussions is just trying to help people mm-hmm. without expectation. Again, if somebody comes and they have something that would be a good fit for us, and I believe that we would be the best partner for them to be successful, then again, that's what we'll go after. But the whole idea, again, 90 plus percent of hardware startups fail. If you look at the legacy of horrible Kickstarter campaigns that were successfully funded and then fizzled out and left a whole bunch of people angry in their wake, Mm -hmm. how can we help those people? Right? How can we help prevent those stories? And now we've built this community and the co-hosts that uh, I'm now hosting this room with all kind of share the same value, right? So how can we be here? How can we be resources? If it's not somebody that's directly on that call that we know, it's like, hey, connect with me or connect with so-and-so on LinkedIn, and I will connect you with three people that I know yeah. that do exactly that, right? So it is building this community. And really, it's a, a great way to give back and help people, again, without expectation. And so you know, maybe when you think of the, well, what's the ROI and the marketing of that? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know, man, right? And it doesn't, mm-hmm. I'm not really worried about it because to your point, we're helping people. We are expanding you know, our brand awareness. And that's right. really what's important. Not understanding exactly that, what the in, ROI in is particular, on my kind yeah, of investment that for moment, hosting that That one video you created, that one blog post you created, it, it's the compounding effect of all of that. And really, I mean, you talk about not expecting any kind of return from those conversations. I think that's the right way to go about something like that. I mean, certainly there's campaigns. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that for a Google AdWords campaign or something along those lines. But, oh, but sure. you know, yeah, what, right. in general, what's good for the industry is good for Ccomp because you know we talked about having a more educated buyer that's just going to increase the demand for what you offer and it's going to make those conversations a lot smoother it's going to increase the sales velocity once those deals are in the pipeline i mean it would be outrageous to think i mean we're having this conversation right it's like for us from a marketing perspective like i wish every company you know in the world had in-depth understanding of of the importance in how digital marketing works because that would do nothing but increase the demand for what we do. You can you might look at it and say, well, if everyone if everyone yeah. knew digital marketing, they <laughs> right. wouldn't need to hire an agency. But that's not true because they would understand how I mean we just outlined, you know, do you want to build a 15 person marketing team or there's are there areas where you could see some help? And you talk about it's not just you know the capability, it's your 15 years of expertise of hey, you know, we've seen all the mistakes, right? We've seen every single you know pitfall a company right. could fall into and we're not going to learn on your dime right we're going to do that we're going to execute and we're going to do this as experts because we've become experts because we failed and we've seen companies fail right so i think that right. piece there you know from a marketing and that's maybe a, a bigger conversation but i think we need to understand as marketers mm-hmm. is like what's good for the industry is good for us and you know they're the customers yeah. are going to find that information right so if you're not the one putting it out there then they're going to find either bad information or they're going to find information from your competitors and they're going to probably go work with them. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, always focusing on the, you know, the impact Mm -hmm. of what we all do, right? Like you're saying, if you help a company like ours tell their story and that helps an entrepreneur find a good partner to bring their product to market that might help track when somebody who's elderly that lives alone falls down and doesn't have a phone next to them, but calls for help because the motion sensors, you know, could tell that there was an event. Mm -hmm. Well, that's impactful, right? That's super impactful. And so if you can improve the lives of people in such a way, and then that entrepreneur, then, you know, their business starts scaling and they start adding jobs and all of that, right? It can be the impact or the ripple effect that goes beyond transaction. The fact that we do SMT and mm-hmm. we do injection molding, like who cares, right? Yes, of course, we have to do that stuff. But the impact of what we do and who we do it for 
is way greater. And so that's the way that we like to. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Terry, efforts. I appreciate you, uh, you joining us today. I think there was, this was uh, very fun for me and I hope uh, the listeners uh, and people watching this enjoyed it. And hopefully you guys took a little bit of nugget of information out of here and maybe it'll inspire you uh, to take that next step and, and start, you know, marketing initiatives internally at your organization. So if people are interested in talking with Terry or working with Terry in the company's uh, ccomp.com, S-E-A, comp.com. Uh, appreciate it, Terry. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Taylor. Appreciate it. Growth Marketers is brought to you by One IMS, helping you reach new heights through integrated marketing. One world, one web, one IMS.